Yes, get those yawns out. <laughs> so, blessings, everyone. Uh, blessed Sabbath to you. And for those who watch this recording, you didn't get to hear what we all heard here, but uh, Pastor Jeffrey from India just shared uh, the state of the church there and just what God is doing and also the, uh, the severity of the trial and the persecutions that are real. Pastor Jeffrey, our problem here in America is that we're lukewarm. We have everything. We have, I mean, we are losing a lot of things right now. And the Bible talks about that the things that your country are being afflicted with, Pakistan, other countries, and why are these things happening? Those, those countries are the embodiment of what will come to America, which is this union of, of a church and a state where you have a, a religion, whether it's Christianity or Islam or anything else, that is dictating through the state what its citizens can and cannot believe. That will come here. We see it and we know that. We've, we've studied prophecy. Uh, and so, yes, our problem here is that we take for granted the liberty that we have, which is why we're losing it, right? And we take for granted our God-given responsibility to study to show ourselves approved. And so I pray that the revivals, and I know that you're a part of the, the getting your, your theological training through that university that, is, that has just had a revival. And we, we pray here that the revivals begin in our hearts, right? That they're not... They're not sensational and driven by emotion. We're not, emotion is an essential part of the process, but the revival should come as we receive repentance. Yes. And then through the word of God, we experience that joy of knowing who Jesus is, knowing who his father is. And then the emotion comes and that's what attracts people. They see Jesus working in us. So I'm going to, um, I, I'll pray and then we'll make a couple announcements and then I'll get into the message. So if you're able to kneel, please. Join me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for stirring uh, our hearts and our minds to the importance and the preciousness of your word, uh, which, Father, we know that it will not come unto you a void. It will finish uh, what you have said, and it will accomplish these things as we've just read in Ezekiel. And the time is now, Father. Let us uh, be... Uh, Father, arouse, just rouse to action. And what is that action? It's, it's to, to know who you are. It's to, uh, Father, to search for you with all of our hearts and then we'll find you and to share what we have found, that pearl of great price with others, even if that means laying our lives down. And so we're encouraged and inspired by this testimony. We do pray for Pastor Jeff and his wife, all of those there in India uh, who are also being persecuted for their faith, for, for you and your son, Father. I pray that you would help them to remain strong and steadfast and to find comfort in you as the God of all comfort and that in spite of what, say, what Satan intends for evil, you will work out for good. And uh, we just pray that you'll be with us now in this service. Give me of your spirit, Father, that the words that I speak would be according to your word and that they would be edifying and encouraging. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. A couple of uh, events announcements. We are fast approaching the seventh month of the biblical calendar, and that means we have a tremendous amount of the Spirit of God available. Tremendous. He gives us His Spirit every day, but He pours out even more at certain times, His appointed times. And this, tonight, actually will mark the beginning of the seventh month with the new moon. And we know that in Isaiah, it says that from one new moon to another, we will gather from one Sabbath to another on the new earth. We know that for God's people in the Old Testament, they're also gathering at these times. So why not gather these times now if there's a blessing to be had? And that's what God wants to do. He wants to bless us. He wants to give us special strength and light and health uh, to prepare uh, to be used by him to take this message to the earth, to lighten the earth with the revelation of his character, right? So, trumpet starts. That's the new, the new moon of the seventh month. That begins tonight. So we're experiencing already this rising of the tide of the Spirit of God in the Sabbath, going into the new moon, and then ten days from trumpets is atonement, and then from there we have tabernacles a few days after that. And we have a number of events happening. So, First, tomorrow, anybody who is interested, wants to make the drive, uh, Marie and I are opening up our home at 5.30 p.m. for a meal, and then I'll share a message. 
So all are welcome, and uh, if you're able, you can bring some food to share. Uh, if not, just bring yourself. And uh, I understand that it is a bit of a drive for some of us. So just wanted to extend that invitation. And then uh, on, we'll have, we don't have anything officially planned for the Day of Atonement. We may end up doing something, and if we do, I'll communicate through emails and, and our other messaging apps. And then we have our Tabernacles program. That is October 1st through the 8th. And that is going to be over by Lake Notley or Morganton area, so just east of Blue Ridge. From here, hour and 15 minutes. And so we're gonna, we have a facility rented for the whole week. There are limited accommodations on site. There's plenty of tent camping space for those who want to enjoy the outdoors. And uh, we're gonna have uh, a lot of people coming from a lot of different places, uh, from multiple countries. And so we're really looking forward to that. And uh, we'd love to see you, even if it's just for a day, even for the Sabbath. Uh, also then in the end of October, beginning October 21st, we're planning to have meetings here. Pastor Adrian Ebens from Australia is coming back. And we're planning to have meetings here from October 21st through to the 31st, a Bible training series. So in-depth Bible study each and every day where we're going to look at it systematically. And so if you guys are available for that, for any of that, we'll have more details as to the specifics, but yeah, just mark that in your calendars. Again, October 21st, which is the Sabbath, through the 31st, and then he, Pastor Adrian, is going to move on. A number of us will attend with him to Arkansas. He's going to do meetings in Arkansas the next weekend, the first weekend in um, November. And then from there, a few people will, uh, Obadiah is going to travel with him, and a few others. Danny Brown, most of you know Danny from Thailand. He will also be accompanying him and another young man, and they're going to do a road trip across the southern part of the country ending in Northern California and sharing, doing meetings along the way. So that's, uh, that's our events calendar. Oh, and if anybody is interested in donating to the ministry, Father of Love Fellowship, you can just see me. Normally I have a tithe box, but I forgot it today. And we do this kind of work where we have, uh, for the, most of us know what we do, but we do, uh, we share the gospel. We share this revelation of the one true God, the Father of whom are all things and his son, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things. This is life eternal, that we would know God and His Son. And we share that in print, in sermons, in Bible working, in canvassing, and then we support people in the world field in a number of different countries translating this into many languages. I think we have, I wish um, Danny Brown was here. You would love to meet him. He could tell you a little bit more about if we have any, we are doing some translation work into some of the languages in India. Um, so yeah, we can connect. And Pastor Jeffrey, and we can see, maybe you can connect with Danny even as well. So, okay, um, that being said, let's, uh, let's get into the message. So, I, I titled this, Rest, Worth, and Wholeness of Mind. Rest, Worth, and Wholeness of Mind. I'm just going to take a drink of water here. Okay, there's a, a favorite verse that just came to mind of mine that when I was baptized, speaking of wholeness of mind, let's go to Romans. Romans chapter 12, I believe. And verse 2. Romans 12, verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how are our minds transformed? We'll look at that through this message. And how do we deal with difficult situations as we've heard from Pastor Jeffers, as we heard from Malcolm, what's going on in Pakistan and many other places that we're not familiar with, they're dealing with levels of trauma and persecution and hardship that most of us can't relate with at this time. But for those of us, we're all called to be missionaries, and missionary work begins in our homes. So what, what, what happens in our homes when we have disunity? What happens when spouses 
aren't on the same page. Maybe one's a believer and one's not, or maybe one has a different understanding of God than the other one. Um, and what about you know, parents who are being disrespected by their children? How do we deal with these things? How, how can we deal with this and still have rest and a sense of wholeness of mind? Because that, these are very stressful situations when we're not on the same page with someone. And, and again, we see, we see the ultimate totality of that is in persecution. Uh, but it, it has many stages leading up to that point. So how do, you, how do we deal with when it's unsettled in the home? And what about if we're being taken advantage of by people that we think care about us or are being manipulated by them? How do we deal with these things? Like, what's, what's the right way to respond to this? And also, how do we know when somebody's being unreasonable with us? If we've lived a life where we've been taken advantage of, manipulated, uh, where we've been made out, you know, to, to be, uh, almost have a, a, a incorrect sense of what it means to help and serve someone in, in our worth and value, how, how do we know when somebody's being unreasonable? A lot of times we, we don't, right? And uh, what do we do once we, if we realize that, that, wow, I'm being manipulated, I'm being taken advantage of, somebody's taking advantage of my generosity or my time, uh, what, do we, what do we do? What's the right way to respond? And can, can we relate with these situations? I, I, I'm pretty sure probably every one of us in different ways. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to illustrate more situations as well along the way. Um, how would Jesus ultimately, that's, that's the answer, right? So to know how to deal with these things, of what's appropriate, what's not, what happens when you're not on the same page with your spouse, or when you're being disrespected, or your children disrespecting you, or parents maybe even you know, controlling the children. Um, they're very, and we'll talk about various levels of abuse as well. How do, how do we deal with this? Um, and do we, do we do which is natural, right? If, if, if I am being, if my character is being attacked, if I'm being accused of things, if I'm being yelled at, if, if, I'm, if people are spreading lies about me, naturally I want to defend myself. I want to rise up. I want to fight with my words. Uh, I want to set, set them straight, right? Uh, and what about our value? If we think about what makes us value, what makes us worthy, does that affect? So, in other words, how we see ourselves and how we see our identity, does that affect how we respond to these types of situations? To being taken advantage of, to being used, to being disrespected, uh, to having tension in the home? I would say absolutely. That, that tr it affects our sense of worth and value, affects how we respond to that tremendously. And if my worth and value is found in uh, being right, uh, being a leader, being uh, intelligent, being, a th you know, having authority, if that's where my value is in and not in my relationship with God, then I am going to be tempted to fight back, to yell, to be disrespectful back, to meet fire with fire, right? To return railings or accusations for more railings, to be defensive in other words. Let's look at just some practical things now from, from the life of Jesus and what he taught us. When we have disunity in the home, disunity between spouses or between people you work with, maybe even between people in ministry, things like that, uh, between you and your children, how do we respond to that? And we've talked about this already, what Donnie was touching on. Is it just, is being a Christian all about just what we say, or is it how we live and what we do? So in the face of these challenges and this tension in the home, let's, let's look at what Jesus says in Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So in the face of being disrespected, of being yelled at or accused of things that were not falsely, just let our good works speak for us. The battle belongs to who? Me? Do I fight the battle? 
No, it belongs unto God. All that matters, and we'll look at this in more depth, all that matters is what my Heavenly Father thinks about me. As that goes from my head to my heart, then I can meet these types of situations with a Christ-like character and just let my works testify rather than trying to get the last word in, right? When you guys have been in arguments, it's always about, I want to have the last word. But does that, does that convert somebody? Does that win somebody over to our cause? Pretty much almost never. So, okay, let's go into more of that. How do we respond? And it's also, it's, it's, kind of, it's counterintuitive, isn't it? It's counterintuitive to not argue and defend ourselves and to remain silent when, you know, bitter, angry, or, you know, very emotional words are, are thrown at us. Let's look at uh, Proverbs 25 for some more practical counsel here from the wisdom of God through Solomon. Proverbs 25, 15. There's a, there's a number of verses. I, I have a number listed. I'm not going to go through all of them for the sake of time, but I'll choose a few. So Proverbs 25, 15. By long forbearing is a prince persuaded, and a soft tongue breaketh the bone. It's impossible to do without Christ in us. A soft tongue breaketh the bone. You can really, I mean, Pastor Jeffrey and what you guys are dealing with and those in Pakistan, this, this applies just as much or, or even more so in the face of being persecuted and potentially losing your life. How do we answer them? You know, we try to fight and defend ourselves physically. What does Jesus say? You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I say unto you what? Resist, not evil. Not evil. Yes. So when you're faced with physical violence, Jesus is saying, don't resist that. Don't, in turn, try to bring physical violence to them. That's, and, and why? Why does he say that? Where in his life has he done that? To his enemies. He's not just telling us, do this because I say so. This is how I am, and this is how my father is. Okay, let's look at another one in Proverbs. We'll get a couple more in Proverbs here. Let's do Proverbs 19, 11. Proverbs 19, verse 11. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. So in, in, to apply this to kind of some of the examples I've been talking about, when, when somebody's wanting to argue with me, with the Spirit of Christ, it is, again, my discretion to be slow to anger and to pass over their transgression. In other words, you don't even have to acknowledge it. You, you get, again, a, a soft answer breaketh the bone. It breaks the spirit and that emotion and passion because when you act like that, somebody, when you raise your voice like this, I get your attention, that, what do you do? Like it, it just raises your energy, your emotional level, and, and they expect, I, I would expect, like you're going to do that back to me. But if I don't receive that same amount of energy back, and in those words, it, it changes you. It, it just, it de-escalates the situation. And again, this is, we cannot do this on our own. This is, this is not a how-to manual of, okay, I'm going to do this. No, it's like, God, help me in these situations that I find myself in. I believe that you will, and we'll look at more of that, why we can believe that, why we have that confidence. Okay, let's look at maybe one more in Proverbs. Um... Let's look at 17, Proverbs 17, 27. He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. So, if we have knowledge, a correct knowledge of God, which we know Jesus came to reveal to us. He came to give us a knowledge of him who is true. So in other words, if we have Jesus, that knowledge will lead to having discretion or to, be, to, to sparing what we say. And that would apply in, again, to when we're being baited, ultimately by Satan. It's not 
when we're being attacked, it's ultimately not that person is not the problem. It's they're, they're allowing Satan to use them, right? That any, and I'm, when I say allowing Satan, I'm not talking about like even full out possession. I'm just talking about any spirit, any behavior, emotion, words, the words that we speak in action that is contrary to Christ, that if we use, if we have discretion and if we have the correct knowledge of God and Jesus working in us, we will spare our words. We won't need to retaliate. Why? Because my value doesn't come from being right. It doesn't come from winning the argument. It doesn't come from what they think about me. It comes from what God thinks about me. And in 1 Peter 3, 9, when dealing again with arguments and, and not being on the same page with those in our homes, or anyone for that matter, 1 Peter 3, 9. Not rendering evil for evil, or railing for railing, but contrarize blessing. So returning evil or railing with blessings. Do good to those who seek to spitefully use us, who hate us, who persecute us. Knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. We receive a blessing by responding in this manner, because this is what God is like. This is how Jesus treated his enemies, and we're blessed when we allow him to work through us, because this gives the other person an opportunity to see they're wrong. If I, if I defend myself and fight and rise up, whether it's with my words or physically, it gives them very little opportunity to, uh, to respond to the Spirit of God and, and be convicted that what they did, how they treated me, what they said, how they said it, that those things aren't of the Spirit of Christ if I'm retaliating. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So what about abuse? I mean, that's, to a degree, we've talked about some abuse, verbal abuse, but let's just, we, we need to talk about, just, just briefly, like if, if we're in a home and there's physical abuse, if there's violence, if there's sexual abuse, or if, if it is so unstable, it, then you, you have to get out. You have to get out of that situation. You have to pray, you have to, you have to talk to somebody and get help. That is, God is not asking you to stay and be beaten to a pulp or to be sexually abused. And I know for children, they don't know what to do. And, and how much of this goes on in the world that we're not aware of, it, it's horrifying, horrifying. And this is, this is the one place where, again, the laws of this country, they, they, you have to be, there has to be evidence that these things are going on in the home physical or sexual abuse for the law to be able to step in and protect you. And so how many crimes are going on that they're com completely unaware of? It, it's, it's, such, it's such a tragedy because if Satan can destroy the family, if he can destroy a child's life through verbal, physical abuse, sexual abuse, I mean, there's so little chance of them recovering, of knowing their true identity, of knowing who God is, because we perceive God based upon our authority and parents, and it, it psychologically damages us to a degree that is not, it's not impossible, but is incredibly difficult. And Satan knows, he knows how to do these things. And so, again, I'm just saying, if, if it is in an extreme, to that extreme level, you, you need to get out and you need to get help. What about, to a lesser degree, just being used or manipulated? Well, you just say no. You say no. But you do it in love. You do it in the spirit of Christ. You appeal if it's somebody who is in authority over you, if it's a parent or if it's a spouse. You do it respectfully, but you do it firmly. And I know for all, all, some of us, we've all had to learn at times, and we're still learning and failing at this, a lot of times people are, are well-intentioned and asking us, can you help me with this and can you do that and I'd like you to do this. Um, and other times they're not well-intentioned. It is intentional manipulation, but, but we have the freedom of choice to say, no, I can't do that right now. Like, I'd like to, but I can't. No, I have this to take care of. And that's okay. It's not being unloving. It's not being unmerciful. It's not being unchristlike to say no. If what they're asking and the amount of times they're asking you to do it is affecting your mental and physical well-being, right? Does that, does, that, does that make sense? That is that is a dysfunctional and unhealthy thought process to allow ourselves to be used to the point of 
physically and mentally not being well. And again, you in love, you firmly say, no, I can't do that. Okay. And if that's, and I know it's hard. Uh, so how do we do these things? Again, at the end of the day, just like me not retaliating when somebody is wanting to goad me or engage me, you know, it only happens through Christ. The only way that I can actually have the courage to say no in love, is the Spirit of Christ, is to know my identity and my value. What does my Heavenly Father think about me? What does Jesus think about me? And when we know that, not just up here, but in our hearts, then we can have that courage, that the faith of Jesus actively can work, and we can have respect for us, that we can take care of ourselves. I'm not talking about being selfish. And I know that if we've been used to so much abuse, it seems, oh, well, I'm being selfish with it. No, if you're in an unhealthy situation, it's not selfish. It doesn't, again, you don't have to do this in a disrespectful way. You don't have to yell. You can firmly say these things, right? Okay, so let's start to look at how do we know, where does my value lie? What makes me significant? What is my identity so it can help us in these situations? Let's look at Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, 46 through 48. I think it's raining out there now. Symbol of the Spirit of God. Amen. Okay, so Luke 9, 46 to 48. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be the greatest? And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, he was reading their thoughts, he took a child and set it by him. It's brilliant what he did. How he addressed the striving for self-supremacy. The striving for who is going to be the leader. Who is going to get the most recognition. The most authority. The most accolades. How does he address it? He sits a child right by him and he says this. And said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. Like that's... that's completely contrary to where their state of mind was at that moment. What, what, what are you, a child? What, what is this? What do you mean? And for he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. It's remarkable. This is talking about our value. They were trying to find value and identity in their positions, in their titles, in being first, in having, again, having everybody looking at them, you know, praising them for their accolades. And this is what ultimately, maybe I'll preach about this at Tabernacles, this is what led to the fall, the falling away of the peer apostolic church, of the apostles within just 40 years after their deaths. And Paul even warned in his day that grievous wolves would come among you and that this falling away would happen from within and that this would eventually result in this spirit that is described as and seen in a false system of worship. And that's this man of sin. And Paul was warning about this. And so this, this is something that is very real and that every single one of us deals with, if we're being honest with ourselves. Okay, so what, what does God think toward us? Where is our value truly? If it's not in, uh, and I'll, I'll touch on this more in depth, if it's not in these things, like our positions, uh, then what is God thinking? Let's look at Psalms 40, verse 5. Just some, a few beautiful promises that remind us how God sees us. Psalms 40, verse 5. Many, O Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and, my th and thy thoughts which are to us word, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. So God is thinking about us all the time, each one of us individually. It doesn't matter that he has billions of children. We all have his undivided attention. He's outside of time. He is eternal. And so he's thinking about us all the time. What kind of thoughts? What is he thinking about us? Yes, let's look at Jeremiah 29. Verse 11, Jeremiah 29, 11.
For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to bring you, to give you an expected end or purpose. So his thoughts toward us are thoughts of peace. What about when I sin? Does his thoughts change? I'm the Lord, I change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Does it grieve him? Does it affect God when we sin? Absolutely. But his thoughts are not evil toward us. That's comforting. I'm in. All right, let's look at Luke 12, 6 to 7. Again, God's thoughts toward us and, and how precious we are in his sight. Luke 12, 6 and 7. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings, and not one of them is forgotten before God? But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are of more value than many sparrows. How precious and how tender is our Heavenly Father that He knows every bit of his creation, the sparrows, even little bugs and insects that gross us out, bacteria, you know, all these things that we can't even see with our eyes. He, he knows all of these things and he takes care of his creation. That doesn't mean that, that sin hasn't marred his creation. That's because God is a God of free will. And he has allowed these things. He's allowed his creation of which we are chiefest, right? Male and female created he them, made in his image of him and his son, but he's allowed sin to play out because of freedom, the consequences that come with that freedom when we choose to turn away from him. And so we see that marring, but he's not the originator of evil. He's saying, my thoughts toward your thoughts of peace. These things are to help us when, again, when we're being challenged, when people are wanting to fight with us or argue with us or even take our lives. So let's talk a little bit about some of the challenges in America right now. We we have a, a, this increasing amount of financial pressure that's being placed upon the middle class and the poor. And we, we've seen this, we're experiencing it ourselves. And right now in America, we, we do have a housing crisis. Um, I mean, whether it's trying to get onto lists for low-income housing, which many people qualify for, but there's not enough housing, or uh, just in general, the, the real estate market, there are housing shortages all over this country. And there are many reasons for that, reasons that are being orchestrated by, to, to some degree, maybe a large degree, by wicked men, by Satan himself. Uh, but we've seen in the last two years, the average home price in America has gone, it was at about $210,000. Now it's over $400,000 in just two years. Doubling of the home prices. And then what about, what about mortgage rates? We have uh, now, I think, Interest mortgage interest rates are over 7% for 30-year 30, 30 mortgages. And uh, it, within the last, I think since 2001, 2001, they were at an all-time low. They, could, they were under 3%, 2 point something percent. So in just a couple of years' time, we've gone over 7%. So if you're wanting to have a house, uh, then you come up with that down payment, and then if you can get a loan from a bank, you're paying, you know, for an average house now, $400,000, you're talking like, $2,500 to $3,000 a month on your mortgage, potentially. That's, that's just out of the question for the vast majority of people. I think I've heard statistics that 50, about 54% of Americans right now, if, if we should have a crisis hit, we can't put our hands on $1,000, meaning we don't have $1,000 or more saved. That's oh, the majority of Americans. So how do, what do we do in these situations? How do we respond to this? I mean, you have inflation. Well, I mean, we've had all these endless wars going on in our country since the early 2000s, and that has cost us billions and billions and trillions. I don't know how many trillions now. We had the lockdowns in this country that cost us also, I think, it was in the several trillions of dollars, and the, now the war in Ukraine, billions more. We're approaching or have exceeded $100 billion that this government has given to Ukraine, uh, which violates all the principles of the gospel itself. God, Jesus' kingdom isn't of this world. If it was, his servants would fight. But yet, we can't take care of our own people. We have billions and trillions of dollars for all these things, but we're having trouble taking care of, of 
the people that need it. Like in Hawaii, in the fires, on Maui, Lahaina, if any of you follow that, it, the, the response is, is woefully inadequate and dismal, but yet we're sending billions of dollars over there. And, and so what's going on? And like, how do we deal with this? Well, we find comfort in knowing that God is thinking about us all the time, that his thoughts are peace, and that, look at this verse, look at this promise, Philippians 4. Turn to Philippians 4, verse 19. Of course, we can add on to that health challenges and insurance not covering a lot of treatments that people need, especially if they're alternative, more naturopathic. Um, the, the medical system isn't conv is not addressing adequately a lot of certain health challenges that are arising. We see a lot of problems with that. And, and the, um, the amount of money we spend on insurance, how do we deal with all these things? Philippians 4.19. But my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. And one more. Matthew 6, verse 33. This is how we deal with this when we're, if we're experiencing financial stress or where am I going to live and am I going to be able to find a home? Is it going to be affordable? Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What, what could that practically mean? Seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness. Get to know him. What does that mean? How do we get to know him? We spend time daily in prayer, morning and evening, and in study, getting to know Him, seek His kingdom. Because we see that the principles of His kingdom are not the principles of the kingdoms of this world. And the kingdoms of this world are built upon the very same feelings and emotions that are causing us to want to fight and defend ourselves and get the last word into arguments or be used and abused and manipulated. It's this, this worthlessness that, that Satan is trying to afflict every one of us with to, to cause us to be blinded to who our Heavenly Father really is. Okay, so how do we deal with trauma from our past and, and this subject of mental health? Well, I mean, simply put, we go to Him who is whole, who is pure, and has complete soundness of mind. We go to Jesus. I want to look at a verse here in Proverbs. We're going to go back to Proverbs. Proverbs 4.23. This identifies really the root of, of our issues that, that lead us into these struggles with dysfunctional thinking, with how, you know, with things that perpetuate trauma that we've experienced, because virtually all of us have experienced trauma to some degree or another in our lives, especially when we're younger. So Proverbs 4.23. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So what is going on in our minds, the heart symbolizing our minds, how we allow emotions to affect our thinking? Solomon is saying, guard these things, for out of it is all of life, all the issues of life, how we approach our lives, how we relate with one another. Can we trust authority? Well, if we didn't have good examples in our childhood, if we've been abused by authority figures or lied to or manipulated or, or have been forced into legalistic systems and have been told or given wrong examples of what God's like, it's very difficult. But again, we can go to the author of wholeness, the one who came to give us life in life more abundantly. Hey, Janet, greetings. So, these thought patterns, of, these dysfunctional thought patterns that, that lead to depressive thoughts, anxious thoughts, angry thoughts, how do we get through these things? And what are some of these? We have to, th we have to, I have to bring a few of these things up so we can think about them. And it's not, take these things to God, think about what I'm saying on this message, pray, are, am I still dealing with these things? Because a lot of times, we say, yes, yes, that makes sense. Yes, there's dysfunctional thoughts, but we tend to deceive ourselves. We're not even aware a lot of times of things, sins, patterns of unbelief, negative thinking. So we need, we need to ask God to reveal these things to us. And he knows what we're ready for. 
And thank God for that because of his tenderness. So how do we talk to ourselves in our heads, right? In our thoughts. We say things like, oh, I never get it right. I'm never good enough. I don't look good enough. I can't do that. I'm not smart enough. No one wants to hear me. Nobody wants to listen to what I have to say. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not handsome enough. These kinds of thoughts. These are dysfunctional thoughts. Where does it, what does it have to do with what God thinks about us? We've just looked at it. And there's many more verses. None of these things matter to God. They, they matter to him in the sense that he grieves and doesn't want us to feel worthless because of these things. A lot of these things which are just straight up lies. But even if we have dysfunctions, because every one of us does, none, none of us look perfectly. We all have wrong physical features that we wish were different. We, we wish we could remember things better or I could articulate myself more or that I knew more or that I, could, I was more fit or stronger or I had more money. None of these things matter to God. That's not why He loves us. That's not why He cares about us. These are toxic and negative thoughts. And a lot of these things can, they can become very destructive because we obsess over these things. And they become so, they become so ingrained that they become subconscious. We're not even aware a lot of the times of that we do these things. And we have a manifestation of this that look like self-sabotaging behavior. We know we want something better, but yet when we get toward having that, whether it's relationships, whether it's physical health, whether it's a change of job or anything that is going to lead us into a more stable place, we have that voice, those negative thoughts that come back and say, you're not, you're not worthy of that. Who do you think you are? Don't you remember what happened in the past or what your parents said you are, that you'll never, you're never good enough or the things that you have done? You're not worthy of these things, but our worth does not come upon what other people have said about us or what we say to ourselves. Our worth is what God says and we find it here in His Word. We find it in the Bible. We find it in the life of Jesus. That's what we need. And that this is a battle, guys. This is a battle because our feelings are constantly trying to sabotage us. And we tend to allow our feelings to override the Word of God. This is the greatest fight and the greatest test that we have. And we have hope because Jesus won that battle over His feelings on earth when everybody forsook Him. Everybody. And He felt even as though His Father forsook Him, but yet He held on in spite of His feelings. And also, these, these negative thought patterns, these can lead to addictive behaviors whether it's addictions to food, whether it's addictions to drugs and alcohol, whether it's addictions to pornography. When I was younger, in my early 20s, I was engaged in pornography and things that come with that. And it wasn't until I understood who God was and that once I became a Christian, because I didn't grow up Christian, but once I became a Christian, my first picture of God was wrong. And every time I would fall back into these sinful practices and engage and succumb to these strong feelings and passions of lust, I would condemn myself. I would get upset at myself. And guess what? It just further affirmed me in engaging in that again. Because I was afraid to go to God who would give me that victory and give me comfort. Why? Because I didn't know that his thoughts toward me were not thoughts of evil, but thoughts of peace. As Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, neither do I condemn you. And once you realize that, your entire life will change. You won't sin anymore. Because it's His goodness that leads us to repentance. That's what helps us to break this cycle of addictions, knowing who God is. It's still a battle because our feelings, because look, this, this changes us physiologically. We have chemical imbalances, neurotransmitter issues, cell receptor on the scientific level that want to pull us, pull us back because it's changed those pathways. But that can be reset as we begin to understand who God is and where our value is. And that, that is what will give us the victory over these feelings. And knowing that when we make mistakes, because when we want to make changes, typically we have setbacks, right? It doesn't just immediately change for the better. And if we should fail, it's knowing God doesn't condemn me. I can get back up. He will pick me back up. I can run to His arms as the prodigal son did. His father didn't say, son, let me tell you, you squandered the inheritance that I gave you. 
You've done all these wrong things. You've got to make it right. He treated him as though he had never sinned. That's showing us who our Heavenly Father is. And that gives us these victories. over Because ultimately, guys, sin is a destructive and toxic thought process. Sin isn't in the, psych- the secular psychological manual of mental disorders. But that's at the root of all of them. All of them. We've all been, have had mental disorders because of sin. So let's look at Proverbs 23, verse 7. This, this shows us, again, this, the principle behind why it's hard for us to get out of these self-limiting negative spirals of destruction, destructive thoughts and condemnation, but it also shows us the key to being restored and made whole. So the principle is thus, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. So as our hearts are, guard our hearts for all of them are the issues of life. Let our minds be not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. What is that renewing? How do we break the cycle? Again, we look at, we look at who God is. We look at his promises. Look at this. Let's look at a couple of them. Let's look at Psalms 73. These are practical Obadiah likes to give practical messages about what you can do. So here's just a, pra- a few practical promises that help us when we're being plagued with these thoughts of worthlessness, of I'm not good enough, my parents said this about me, uh, I'm, I'm not pretty enough, whatever, all these things. When we're tempted to think our values in what we do and what we look like and what we have, we go to these things. Okay, so Psalm 73, verse 26. Hey, Dale. Seventy-three twenty-six. My flesh and my heart faileth. This is talking about when our, our feelings are. The, as Malcolm had said, the spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak because our our hearts do fail us. That failing means the negative feelings are so strong. I just want to give up, right? But God is the strength of my heart. God is greater than my feelings, and my portion forever. Let's look at one more. Psalms 94, 19. Psalms 94, 19. I'm going to read this one from the New King James. It's, King James is all right, but I think it's clear in the New King James and in some of the other modern translations. So Psalms 94, 19. In the multitude of my anxieties within me, your comforts delight my soul. Your comforts. Praise God. Because it takes a while for those feelings to subside when we're tempted to go back into some sort of addiction or start thinking negatively or indulge in some food or say, oh, I'm, I'm such a slob, I eat too much. Whatever, whatever the, the garbage that goes on in our heads, we're tempted into these things that are dysfunctional or unhealthy, these unhealthy sense because, again, it's, it's the identity message, it's the identity wrestle. We go to these promises and we keep claiming them, we go to different promises and we keep going until these feelings subside. Okay, and there's many more, but we don't have time to go into that. And so here's some pro- other practical things that we can do to help us. When, when, the, when that, that negative self-talk or the temptations are very strong, we're going to do a little personal inventory, prayerful personal inventory. What things am I doing? Who, what am I associating with? What things am I watching and taking in? When I want to relax, what things am I doing? Are those healthy things? Are they mindless entertainment? Are they YouTube videos scrolling through social media reels? Are they, are they secular movies that are giving me wrong impressions? Are they things that are making it even more difficult to overcome these addictions? And if they are, Father, give me the strength to let go of these things, right? And, and also, just to talk practically, how are we taking care of our bodies? What are we eating? Are we being consistent? Are we getting good enough rest and sleep? Are we exercising? Right? You don't have to do crazy exercise. You just go for a walk. You know, like if, look, if we're working in jobs, we're sitting all the time, or we're in the city, living in the city, or working in the city, there's just stress, and it, we're so used to it, we can't even discern it anymore. But you know that there's a difference when you just go into nature, and, and regardless of how difficult your life is or whatever situation has come, you feel at least a little bit better just by going into nature. And then a lot of times you can more clearly 
claim God's promises, hear his word, just going into nature. Just even if, you, if you're so weak and tired, just sit there. Just sit in nature, get sunshine, get rest, enjoy, be immersed in the atmosphere of heaven. Right? These are just practical things that can help make that difference in overcoming. Um, I, think, I think that sums up those. And if, look, if it's, if it's tremendously bad, if we're talking about some addiction that's tremendously bad, guys, it's very destructive, whether it be in pornography, drugs, alcohol, and, and if we're trying all these things and it, we're not getting it, we need help. You need help. You need to in, involve people that you can trust that are godly, that can pray for you, that can encourage you. And if it's absolutely horrendously bad, you need to get checked into some kind of facility. Okay. So, yeah, Dennis. Yeah, can we read First uh, Peter four nineteen? Yeah, please read it for us. First Peter four nineteen. Wherefore let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to Him in well doing as unto a faithful Creator. Mm. Amen. So it goes right along with what you're saying. With well doing. Amen. And for those of us who, for those of us who don't have tremendous health crises where you can barely function, for those of us who are at least able to provide the basics for our families, for those of us who aren't being persecuted, literally where we could lose our lives, um, as Pastor Jeffrey has shared, what does it mean to seek God and His kingdom and His righteousness? Well, it means to take the time in you know multiple times a day regularly, consistently, to know who God is, to study His Word, and understand, as, as the, many of us know, that on the Sabbath, Sabbaths, plural, not just weekly Sabbath, new moons and feasts, because in Leviticus 23 it refers to all of these as Sabbaths and, and feasts, and the first feast is the seventh day Sabbath. God is wanting to give us more of His Spirit, more of His presence, to quiet these thoughts of worthlessness, these addictive and negative thoughts thought processes that lead us to allow our feelings and passions to rule us. And so when we come, when he calls us at these times, there's more blessing, there's more peace, there's more of that sanctifying spirit. We know several places, I'm not going to go into them all now, and maybe, yeah, I'll, I'll look at one of them and then we'll go to the promise, some of the new covenant promises in Ezekiel. But So Exodus 30. 1, verse 13, what, what is the Sabbath about? What are the feasts about? Is it just, well, I'm God, I have rules and laws, and you need to come if you want to be saved. Is that, is that what it's about? And if you don't, I'm going to punish you, and your life on earth is going to be miserable. That's, that doesn't seem like that adds up to what we've just learned about God, who doesn't think any evil toward us. So then these aren't arbitrary days. Exodus 31, 13 says, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbath shall ye keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. The Sabbath is hallowed and sanctified, as it says in Genesis, and it says in Exodus in the Ten Commandments, which includes, as we're about to read, more than just the weekly Sabbath. It's sanctified because God is pouring His Spirit out. He's wanting to give us even more of what he gives us each and every day of the week. Even more light, special strength, understanding in our hearts and minds, strength to overcome the evil one in these temptations of worthlessness that drive us into retaliating, into arguing, into fighting, into allowing people to abuse us, all of these things, right? So let's look at Ezekiel 36, 26 and 27. And this is in the context of these times that God has given us to pour His Spirit out upon us. Ezekiel 36, 26, and 27. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, a heart that can be impressed by the loving thoughts and words of our Heavenly Father. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you shall keep my judgments and do them. The Sabbath, the 
the feasts, the new moons are part of these statutes. Statutes from a father who is love. A father, again, in, in what Jesus said as well, that in John 14, 21, and he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Why? Because his commandments are given out of love. They're there to protect us. God won't force us to keep them. Consequences come when we stray from them, but it's not God punishing us. These are consequences of, if, you, if we drive off the road, you get hurt. Your car crashes. You can get into a wreck. You can potentially die. Right? The, the commandments are the road to life, to more abundant life, to fulfilling relationships, to health. To cause, Look, we live in a sinful world, and every single one of us experiences suffering just because of that fact. But we tend to make it a lot worse, don't we? For all the reasons that I've mentioned, we add on much more suffering because we succumb to these wrong pictures of God, wrong understanding of our value, and then we engage in acts that bring about more consequences. And these consequences aren't God doing them. God is merely allowing these things to happen. And he's here to help us the whole time. And he's grieved watching us as his children suffer needlessly. And what is that new spirit? Jesus points that out in John 14. Yeah, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. And I'm, I'm going to, absolutely, absolutely. Let's, we're going to finish here with just another verse or two. Let's look at, yeah, let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, speaking of the subject of comfort. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 and 4. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all all of our trials and tribulations, whether it's literal, physical persecution, like what we've just learned about in India or Pakistan, or whether it's trials and tribulations in our homes, in our workplaces, in our own thoughts, He's the God of all comfort. Amen. And we've seen why He's the God of all. He's not the God of comfort sometimes, but punishment in other times. No, only thoughts of peace. That we, he comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to do what? To comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. We cannot give to somebody what we don't have. So we first need to receive true sense of worth and value from our Father. Then we can comfort others who are having these, these wrestles with addictions, with being used or abused, with anger, with all these thoughts of worthlessness. We know that there's a beautiful promise as we conclude here in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2 verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So a mind that is whole and healthy and gentle trusting, right? So what is this mind ultimately? We say, yes, amen, that mind that's in Christ Jesus. How do we know? We need to know him. We need to take time to learn who he is. And if we know him, we'll know his father. And so it's, it's a mind, the mind of Jesus, that knows his value isn't dependent upon what he has done. He knows his father loves him because he is his son, not for anything else. He feels safe. He knows that he's protected in, by his heavenly Father. And it's a mind in the end that in spite of what his feelings were telling him about the temptations that Satan was pressing upon him in Gethsemane and in the cross, it's a mind that says this. This is Psalms 31, verse 5. And I believe this is, these are the words that Jesus quoted while he was on the cross before he breathed his last breath. If you compare this, I believe it's the account in Luke, in the Gospel of Luke. The first part of this will sound familiar to you, and I believe he was quoting this verse, and he just didn't finish it. But we know, we know this is the mind of Christ right here. In spite of those circumstances and challenges and those feelings and that darkness, into thine, Psalms 31, verse 5, into thine hand I commit my spirit, 
Thou hast redeemed me, O Lord God of truth. Let this mind be in us, which is also in Christ Jesus. He came so that we would have life and have it more abundantly. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, all we can say is thank you. Hallelujah. We thank you for your love which knows no condition other than that we let you love us and, let you, and that we believe you. And this is the hardest thing. This is our work. When the man came to Jesus and said, what do we need to do to work the works of God? Your son said, believe on him whom you have sent. To believe on your son, Father. That is very difficult at times when life as we've just looked at through these examples, when life seems to press upon us all these cares that seek to drown us in feelings of worthlessness, abandonment, and hopelessness, it's hard to believe, but yet all things are possible through Christ. And as we have his mind, the mind of an overcomer, in spite of circumstances that didn't allow passions and feelings to dissuade him, to deter him, to cause him to give up, in trusting you, that mind is our mind. Thank you, Father. Help us with negative thoughts. Help us with constantly ascribing our worth based upon what we're doing or not doing or our failures or we're not good enough or the voices, the things that we think people think about us or things that people have actually said about us. It doesn't matter, Father. All that matters is what you think about us. And it's not to use that to be unruly, abusive, and as Donnie had said, be Christians just professing in name and be selfish and rude. That, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who are sincerely desirous to reflect your character, but are just struggling, as we all do at times, with these limiting beliefs. Father, we thank you that your Son has come to set us free. If, the son sh if your Son shall make us free, we shall be free indeed. And I thank you, Father, for hearing this prayer, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, thank you, everyone. We're going to have a closing hymn. And then after that, Dennis can have a closing prayer for us and he can pray for the food. So please stay. For those of you who are new, we do have a shared meal. Uh, so please stay and fellowship with us. Thank you.